Hi, it's Jake here, and welcome to The Voluntary Life. This is the first of two episodes about Harry Brown's book, How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World. Before we uh, get on to the discussion of the book, I will just provide a brief background about uh, Harry Brown's life and the book itself. Harry Brown was born in 1933 in New York, but he grew up in Los Angeles. Uh, he dropped out of college to pursue work in sales, but he actually made a career for himself as an investment advisor. And his particular uh, approach to investment was very much informed by a libertarian viewpoint on the negative effects that government has on both the money supply and on investment. So he developed his own idea of investment, which he called the permanent portfolio, which is really centered around how to protect yourself uh, whatever kind of intervention the government does in the economy, so how to protect your investments. And he became famous because uh, he predicted the um, currency devaluation of the early 1970s, and he made a lot of money by investing in gold during the time when currencies around the world were being uh, devalued by uh, government uh, um, printing of money. In fact, he wrote a book called Fail Safe Investing, which had a huge influence on me. And everything that I understand about investing uh, comes from Harry Brown's book, which I highly recommend. If you want to learn more about uh, how you can invest money and, and protect yourself um, from the various ways in which markets are manipulated. As well as an, being an investment advisor, he was also a libertarian thinker and um, public speaker. But he had a particular approach to liberty, which focused on personal liberty. And he wrote How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World in the early 1970s, which was a highly politicised time, where everyone involved in sort of libertarianism was really um, involved in advocating either struggling to reduce government or even advocating its abolition. But they were all very much involved in political life. This is the same time as For a New Liberty was written by Murray Rothbard. Harry Brown had a very different approach um, because he really took uh, the view that freedom is about your own personal life. And How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World is, is a book about, principally about personal freedom. Here's how Harry talks about his concept of freedom. Freedom is the ability to live your life as you want to live it. There are all sorts of definitions of freedom, but that, to me, is the simplest and most direct and the most meaningful. That's what it comes down to. You want to control your own life. You want to live your life as you want to live it, not as George Bush or Bill Clinton or Abraham Lincoln or Teddy Roosevelt or anybody else thinks is best for you, and not only not as they think is best for you, but as your friends think is best for you, or your relatives, or anyone else. More than anything else, it's an attitude. It is a determination that you are not going to be unfree if you don't have to be. And I wrote the book and titled it, How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World, precisely because, first of all, I wanted anybody to understand that I was not talking about changing the world. I was talking about the world that we're living in right now. Not that utopia in the future that we're hoping to build someday, but the unfree world we live in now. And rather than saying how you can be free in an unfree world, I said in a way that would ordinarily offend my own sense of modesty how I found freedom in an, in an unfree world because I wanted people to know that this had already been done by one person at least. So we were not talking about blue sky. The book was highly influential on the libertarian movement, and it was a bestseller in its time. Um, and it led to an, a, a kind of little movement of its own where people were referred to as brownouts or Harry Brownouts, whereby a lot of people who were highly politicized and involved in activism uh, reoriented themselves to look for liberty in their own lives, uh, first and foremost. Even though in the book Harry talks about the pointlessness of political activism. He actually, later in life, became a candidate for the Libertarian Political Party 
in the mid-90s and the 2000 election. And he justified this by pointing to this as being an educational campaign, a way of spreading ideas of liberty, um, rather than saying that he had any idea that he would ever win the election. But he did change his mind on a number of things uh, during his life, including um, his ideas about marriage, as we will talk about in the discussion. One of the things that Harry is well known for is after the 2001 September 11th attacks, he immediately, on September the 12th, wrote an article that was totally against the sort of prevailing tide of patriotism um, and pointed out the cause of the attacks in American foreign policy. And he really stood out as being somebody after September the 11th who was against the incursions on civil liberties, against foreign interventionism and war, and very, very clearly advocated peace and identified the role of the American empire, imperialism, in, in creating the conditions that led to September the 11th. He had two radio shows uh, in his later life, one for investment and one for libertarian talks, and both of those uh, were hugely influential on me. I downloaded all of the audio um, from his investment show that was online and really learnt about investment from uh, listening to that show. I don't know that much about his personal life. He moved around and lived in a number of countries during his life, um, living in Switzerland and abroad for some time. But I think it is interesting to note that this book, How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World, was written at a time when his own life was in a huge state of transition. He had an early marriage that went very badly wrong, and he had a very, very uh, bitter divorce, as far as I understand, where he uh, gave up custody of his daughter, and he didn't see his daughter for many years, although I understand that they reconciled in, in when she uh, became old enough to leave home and, and sort him out. But he wrote this book whilst he was in the process of rebuilding his personal life. And I think some of the ideas... Um, about, especially about relationships, are informed by the time that he wrote this book. He did later in life remarry um, and, and was, uh, by all accounts, uh, very happily married until, until he died. I think the thing that I love most about this book is the title. Uh, the title itself you know, is really such an, a, a powerful statement of what the voluntary life is really all about. Um, finding freedom in an unfree world. Karl Popper once said that in philosophy, answers to, um, to questions come and go, but it's the person who first states a really important question that actually, in a sense, that question is eternal. And how do you find freedom in an unfree world is a really, really powerful question. And this book has a number of answers which some of which we might have a better answer to now and some of which he might still have the best answer to. But the question itself is, is really fundamental. And Harry Brown was the first person who really stated that, who really stated the question for libertarians in that way. How is it that we find freedom in our own lives in an unfree world? The book itself is divided into uh, three parts. The first part is about the traps that keep us from being free. And by traps, um, Harry's really talking about ideas that we have accepted, but we don't need to. For example, the idea that you can't be free unless you devote your life to overthrowing the government first. Um, and so you have to dedicate your life to political change before you, you can actually uh, enjoy uh, freedom yourself. And he runs through a whole series of these traps and describes, you know, why they are traps, why they're actually um, assumptions that are not true. The second part of the book is his ideas about how to be free. So he talks about how to work around the existence of the government, you know, what you can do to actually live with a government, um, but still get as much freedom out of your life as you possibly can. And he also talks about personal relationships, how you can have freedom in personal relationships 
um, in marriage, um, in family, and so forth. And he talks about freedom from the treadmill, as he calls it, how you can have freedom from you know, bad jobs and personal debt and so forth. And that had a huge influence on me. I mean, one of the things I think that's most powerful about this book is his ideas on entrepreneurship and uh, financial freedom, uh, which, of course, he knew a lot about. And, I mean, reading the book really helped me to identify financial freedom uh, and freedom to, to work on things, only on things that I really believe in and that I really feel passionately about. Um, the book really helped me to make a transition to selling my business and pursuing the life that I, that I now lead. And he also talks about freedom from pretense, you know, the freedom to be the person that you really are, or rather than trying to appear to be something that you're not. The third part of the book is about making changes. So it's the transition, how, his ideas on how you make the transition from being in these traps to living the life of freedom. So that's a quick background to the book. We now go on to the first part of the discussion. What follows is the discussion uh, that we had about the book. It's split into two parts. And so I hope you enjoy it. And thank you so much for listening. Hi there. Glad you could make it. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. I'm looking forward to this conversation. So, welcome to another Freedom Book Club. And um, I hope everyone managed to, uh, like Greg, managed to get hold of a copy. It's not an easy book to get, this one, or, or find it somewhere online. What did you guys think? Did you enjoy it? I liked it, yeah. yeah I, found the, I found the book to be uh, very helpful. Um, I was able to apply uh, some of the advice uh, in my own life. Uh, I know the book is often referred to as a self-help book, but I I think that uh, I think ultimately, if I was to encapsulate the book, uh, it's really a handbook of per, of personal secession. Right. And oftentimes, oftentimes people feel compelled to conform to uh, social conventions of one sort or another. Harry calls them traps in the book. And when we make concessions in our lives, uh, we do so ultimately at the cost of our own happiness, our own peace of mind. And so, you know, Harry goes through a bunch of traps, which uh, or he calls them traps. They're, they're social norms, uh, traditions. And he, you know, he explains that that you don't have to you don't have to conform to those you know that you can you can live your life the way that you want to live it rather than uh, appeasing other people's expectations i mean i think that um this book given that it's sort of quite an old book now and 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 so forth that was written in a time when i think people around Harry Brown it was so political. It was such a political time in the 70s. You know, people out demonstrating, and the, all the libertarians were all very, very heavily involved in political activism. But I just think this is fantastic that this is such a clear statement about uh, liberty being about your personal life and about finding freedom in your own life. And there are many things in this book which I, I think uh, in, where he sort of takes his argument in, in different areas that I don't uh, necessarily agree with, but I find them all very thought-provoking and very interesting. Some of it seems to be, I mean, the chapters on morality are a little bit, um, were not, not very principled, a little bit fuzzy, well, they're um, I found. But they're relativistic. I mean, that was the, yeah. that was the going sort of alternative argument of the time, right? 1973. Which, interestingly, yeah. by the way, um, yeah. is also the exact same year of the founding of the Libertarian Party. Right, right. But, um, but I, I think, you know, total kudos to Harry Brown for uh, um, applying. And in this book, you know, he doesn't, he may, in, in my opinion, the chapters on um, relationship with relatives and parents could have been uh, a little bit more sort of expanded. It could have, because in some senses, you know, as we know from, from the conversation that 
for, for many people, uh, gaining liberation from family, um, uh, abusive families or, or poor family, even just poor family relations, um, poor quality family relations is such an important part. And, and he, you know, he, the, those chapters are not very extensive in this book, but I think total kudos to him that he does say very clearly that um, he applies the principle that um, that all relationships are voluntary and that, um, you know, you don't, uh, you, 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 that, that really um, believing in that means that uh, you apply it throughout your personal life, including your relationship with, um, with relatives and, and so forth. And I think that's great. Yeah, I, I think, um, I, I think the key passages are really um, the stuff on the utopia trap. Can you just summarize what that trap is, just like in two sentences? Sure. Well, I'll put it in his words. The utopia trap is the belief that you must create better conditions in society before you yourself can be free. Right? The idea that you right. have to go out and change the, change the world first before you can change yourself. And, and it's not just a trap. I mean, it's, a, um, it's, it's what he doesn't quite get here, but he gets close to, is that it's a defense, right? Um, changing yourself is hard. I mean, it's incredibly hard. So if I go out and uh, work on changing the world instead, right? I don't have to worry about changing myself first. And in, um, as we've learned here, um, in in engaging in uh, social activism, social change, uh, and the the inevitable frustrations in that we can sort of uh, validate the false belief that change is impossible. Right. 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 And further rel- relieve ourselves of the responsibility of change, personal change that is. Um, but when you yeah. think about it, just being willing I mean, to, s- just being willing to say that, like you were saying earlier, I mean, 1973 was five years after the 68 democratic convention, right? 73 was uh, the collapse of the big steel mills. It was the, 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 the huge union strikes. The, the, um, the environmental movement was just getting off the ground then. I mean, everyone was politically active. So being willing to say this um, in a book is, I mean, it is, it's, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty brave. Right. You know, even in the even in the book, uh, yeah. you know, Harry touches on, um, you know, the futility of trying to uh, change the system. You know, he talks about, uh, you know, you just end up spinning your wheels, basically. And and even later on, when he when he decided to run for president as a libertarian, he, he would talk about this on his um, Internet show. And he would talk about how he used to be, uh, you know, he completely lost interest in politics. But, it, you know, like I had mentioned on the board, he never deluded himself or anyone else into thinking that he could actually win. And he was at least honest enough to say that the only reason he ran for president was because he saw it as an opportunity to bring libertarian ideas to others. Uh, and he saw he he thought that it was a uh, a vehicle for spreading libertarian ideas, and he brought he brought those ideas to a lot of people that had never heard of libertarianism before. But he 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 had recognized that it looked as though uh, you know he was acting in contrast to what he had said in the past. But uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's. Uh, it's a lot easier to try and you know change other people than it is ourselves. Yeah. One thing that I really found helpful in this book um, was I read this um, before I sold my business, and the stuff that he writes about the kind of group traps and about the difficulties that you have if you share um, property in a in a joint venture like a partnership or a business or whatever. The fact that that's you know, uh, locks you in to, um, to joint decision-making and so forth. Those things were for me, like, because I, I was, uh, I did have a business partner and it was a very, you know, we, def- we definitely went 
different ways in terms of where we wanted to take the business. And this this book was, um, you know, it, it sort of was a, 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 an appropriate time for me, but it really helped me think through what I wanted to do in terms of, of actually selling the business, getting out of that. Um, and one of the key, you know, reasons for that um, was the freedom uh, that, would, that I would get by doing that. And I think some of the chapters that he has on economic life, you know, working life and, and finances and so forth, I think are, are great because, you know, he was very much a, a free market guy all the way through his life. And I think his, his principles are really sound. And the way that he talks about, for example, in, in business relationships, not trying to enforce relationships through contracts, that you've got to make sure that all the people that you deal with your suppliers or, or customers or whoever, that there always is a good self-interest on both sides that keeps the relationship going, that you know that, you know, the reason that you're doing business together is because you that everyone's benefiting, it's a win-win situation, and not because, you know, somebody's managed to, like, get the other person to sign up to a whole bunch of clauses to commit them to X, Y, and Z that they didn't realize, because it never, it never works. And I, I think that's... Um, that's really, you know, all great stuff. All of the, um, the the sort of principles and advice that he has relating to to um, to, to uh, commercial life in this book. The axiom that runs all the way through the book is to try and identify how each person in any kind of relationship has as much sovereignty, as he calls it, or freedom as possible. And so he's totally against unchosen obligations like family whatever determining what you do and, and, and I think that's great I really I really enjoyed this book I thought it was really great and um, I thought it was really uh, like easily digestible and um, I yeah I, I, I'm really glad that um, it was on the schedule to read um, I don't think that I would have read it otherwise one of the things that I really liked about the book was uh, like the emphasis on um, the individual. Um, I know you guys talked a little bit about that before, but um, I just wanted to add that I really like that. Um, just about like being who you are and, um, you know, pursuing what you like. And that's the way to um, finding people who are going to add to your life and who you can add to their life. Because if you hide yourself, you're not going to, um, people who you are going to want or who are going to be valuable to you just won't see you. And I think that that's really awesome. Um, absolutely. I, absolutely. Okay. I totally agree. And uh, the chapter especially, there's a, a chapter called Freedom from Pretense, which in many ways is about, it's a sort of Harry Brown version of, um, of maybe not RCR, but but he, he is making the point, and in earlier um, ones about the, the, the sort of identity one, he's making the point that, you know, only by actually really um, living who you are are you going to meet people who do accept you for, for who you are and, um, and you, that you can then sort of, you know, get into the kind of relationships and friendships that you, that you want to have. And he has a really nice way of putting it where he sort of describes that he kind of deliberately just drops in some key things about him that he want that like my understanding the things that he wanted to be accepted for like the, the sort of he was mentioning the issue of selfishness and and so forth that in his this is like his words but i just thought it was kind of it's really it's kind of nice that he was clearly like leaving these things out there just like little pebbles to see if anybody was going to pick them up right but that he wasn't going to hide himself and he was just going to you know be who he was and then uh, see, you know, who was out there to take interest. So I was just going to say, um, the one thing I did find kind of interesting in this book and is that, you know, there's, um, he's got a wonderful sense, as you say, Michael, he's got a wonderful sense of self-acceptance, right, that he really, all the way through, he's not, like Harry Brown seems to be a guy who's definitely, who definitely decided during his life that he wasn't going to self-attack, that he was going to be accepting of himself. I did find that there's a little bit of a lack of curiosity 
about, it seemed to me, about his own psychology, basically. He didn't seem that interested in why, you know, things hadn't worked out for him in some relationships. And, like, I found... I found that um, that in some ways, you know, he he's got this great sense of self acceptance, but not a huge amount of interest in in sort of why things had happened. He just seems to kind of move on, you know. Um, and that's just something that I personally sort of found a little bit um, uh, just like a, a little bit suboptimal. In in in, in the, I, I don't know. I think part of freedom is also being free from the things that the deep programming that you get that, that may lead you, that may have led you into some situations that, that, um, that weren't so great. Like for example, his first marriage, right? And he doesn't really seem that interested in, in quite what happened there. But I mean, you know, there you go. Um, that's just, that's just the way it was with him. Well, in the, in the mindset of, 73 um he would have argued that that's exactly what he did do jake uh, is to by by um just accepting what happened in the past and moving on he's free of it right that uh, going back and analyzing it is only enslaving himself to it right? that that's that was sort of the prevailing pop pop yeah. culture psychology he does day, right? he does mention that in the book about uh you know not dwelling on the past uh, just accepting that uh, something didn't go right, and that you, you know you should move forward and just just learn from it and make sure it doesn't happen again. Yeah, I, I noticed that too. Um, and another thing that stood out to me in the book, and it was in in quite a few different places, um, was he he regarded vulnerability as this like horrible thing put yourself in the position up and and I think and I think like every single time he used the word vulnerable it was like in a dangerous way and I think that um, that's really interesting because it, it can be very very dangerous to be vulnerable with uh, people who are going to take advantage of you but that's something that, that stood out to me especially in the chapter about marriage where, you know, he's just saying, like, you don't want to put yourself in a vulnerable position. But I found, personally, that putting yourself in a vulnerable position with people, um, with good people, it's a beautiful thing, and it's, it's, uh, it, it's really satisfying. It kind of goes with the whole, um, like, if you show yourself, then you'll find people who are going to fit in your life really great. Yeah, I did want... I did want to ask you, Marissa, because you mentioned um, on the board um, that you thought it was a great book, except for the chapter on marriage. And I was very curious uh, on your thoughts on it, because he's obviously got all sorts of ideas about um, marriage. And so what, what did you make of, of, um, of his, um, his ideas on that? Well, um, first of all, I, I did, I, I put on there that I was going to put it from five stars to four stars, but then... Um, I read some of the afterward, or I forget what he called. I think it was afterward, and he actually did amend some of what he said on marriage. Um, he he got married again and mentioned that you know like it, it's a really wonderful thing, and that uh, <clears throat> I can't remember his exact words, but you know that he admitted that there was some flaw in, in his logic, which I was really happy to read. <laughs> Yeah, I thought that was really, really awesome, and and also really like stand up, like for him to just be like, oh, actually, you guys, I forgot about this thing. Yeah, in the stuff that he had to say about marriage uh, in the book itself, I just, I, I mean, I, I understood what he was trying to say, and I don't think that his points were necessarily all wrong. Like, uh. I could see how the relationships that he set up would work, um, but I feel like he he was um, really like set in his idea that marriage equals disaster. Like marriage will lead to a failed relationship because of vulnerability involved in like committing yourself to somebody. But I still think that marriage is like a completely wonderful thing, and and I think. Well, I mean, 
I, I don't I don't know like I don't have like hard evidence for this, but I think that there's something that can be achieved in marriage that can't be achieved in um in the relationship that he describes where there's kind of like one foot out the door. Hmm. Um, oh, I see what you're saying. So is it sort of like a um for yeah, him it's yeah. kind of a false dichotomy. Right, yeah. I think Harry's views on marriage uh, changed um, considerably as he got older. Um, he may he may not have still held the beliefs in the book uh, from when he first wrote it um, to later in life. You know, he used to speak very highly of his wife when he gave his uh, nomination speech in 2000. Um, I remember him saying something to the effect that next to uh, you know, marrying his wife, Pamela, that, that was the happiest day of his life. And he would talk about his marriage on his radio show on the internet occasionally. And there was one thing that he said to me that, uh, that I hadn't thought about in the past only because we, we are just, we're conditioned to think that in order to have a happy, satisfying relationship with somebody that you have to make enormous sacrifices. And he, he said, uh, he said that that's just not true. It, you know, we, we've been taught all our lives that in order to have a fulfilling, happy marriage, that you have to sacrifice 80% in order to get 20%. But he said it's exactly the opposite. Is you'd only have to sacrifice 20% in order to get 80%. And he said that that's, that's how his marriage was. But, yeah. Yeah. you know, part of his philosophy was that you know that's only going to happen if you if you don't make if you don't capitulate and make uh, you know concessions to these to these traps that he talks about. You know you want to you want to pursue what's important to you and meet somebody th- that shares your views, shares your values, uh, shares your worldview, and and then you'll have a happy, fulfilling relationship. Right. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. And one one thing also that, that struck me, and, and I think you're right, Alan, I think that his um his views did change uh, after he wrote the book. Um, but but one thing in the book, because uh, if we're just talking about the book itself, one thing in the marriage chapter that was just like what to me was um the uh this part that he wrote about having like like if you live with somebody that uh, it's much less, it would be a lot less of a conflict if you, like, have one person as the owner and then the other person, like, subletting. And I could see how that would be way more complicated. Like, and and how that, that might, I mean, personally, I think that I would like that a lot less than, like, sharing. I just, um, yeah, just on that point, just just before you get into it, I just wanted to quickly say, because I think this is a fascinating one, but I just read that um, section on uh, that Harry wrote in the in the um, afterward that you're talking about, and I've got to say, like I really like because I I knew that Harry had been remarried, so I also thought when I was reading this chapter, like hmm, yeah, all this stuff about marriage being not that great, it doesn't seem like he he actually lived his values. But I've got to say, you know, I mean. That's really stand up that he then said in his book, you know what, actually I changed my mind. Like, I just think that's fantastic because, um, yeah. you know, it's, it's, he had the, the intellectual honesty to say, yeah, I thought that then, and look, I've done something different, so there you go, I've changed my mind. But, um, so yeah, I, I think I, I've got a lot of admiration for that. And Marissa, that point that you were talking about, I think is, I, I wanted to, to ask you, and everyone about this, because I think this is a fascinating idea. And basically, it seems to me, so as far as I get it, his idea is, because he's a totally free market-oriented guy, right? And his idea is that communal property is bad news, that communal property leads to conflict. And consequently, he just takes this to the max, and he just says, okay, well, then just don't have any communal property, So his concept is that in any relationship, in any marriage, you would literally say, okay, well, I'll have the car 
and yours, you know, it's your house, but it's my dog, and it's your, you know, and, and basically nothing is communal. And everything, you know, even if, you're, even if it's shared, has an ultimate owner, right? And this is one of those ideas that, you know, I really appreciate that he's written this because it gives me a lot to think about, you know. This is like a really interesting idea to say, well, yeah, I mean, in a sense, you, you know, if you're going to live your values and if you think that shared, that communism is a kind of, you know, is a failed idea, then he's just sort of applying it across the board, which is, I think, it's an absolutely fascinating idea. Can I suggest an objection to that? Sure. Uh, if, if you listen carefully to what he's saying, it's not the communal property in the marriage that's the problem. It's the conflict for him. The real problem is that he couldn't figure out how to resolve the conflict without getting rid of the communal property, right? And that conflict, in his mind, always le- is, is always a, a bad thing, right? Why is conflict always a bad thing? Why can't it be uh, a good thing? Well, I guess, like, to play devil's advocate, right, I guess sure. the, argument, the argument would be this. As libertarians, we all agree that um, the, the vital importance of property rights over scarce resources is that, um, you know, essentially the only moral way of determining who owns what is who actually owns it or is the first person to homestead it or whatever. And that any, any other kind of, um, you know, communal, shared or reallocated things just leads to, uh, is A, immoral and B, has all sorts of, you know, they argue, you can argue from consequences as well, right? That would be the kind of Mises Institute view on property rights. Right. And I guess his argument is just saying, okay, well, I'm just going to apply that into personal life too. Right. It seems like it's a little different though, because with like, Communism, the problem, the reason why it's a problem that everything's communal is because it's done by force. Whereas in a relationship, that would be a voluntary, um, like giving up of your property rights or at least just the shared property rights. Right. It would be a negotiation, yeah. right? And, and that's, that's funny. very true. And that's fundamentally the problem is he's saying that he didn't know how to negotiate with his partner. So rather than negotiate, we're just going to say, okay, just automatically assign ownership to things, and therefore whatever I say about the dog goes, whatever you say about the house goes, period. Well, I was just saying, like, I don't I, – I mean, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what I think about that because, I mean, if – let's just use the example of a marriage where there's private property – I don't know that that necessarily excludes negotiation because, I mean, let's, let's use it to the extreme and say that the wife owns the microwave and the husband owns the refrigerator. Like, that's just kind of like ownership, but then there's still like they're allowing use of their things, right? So that exactly. I don't know that it necessarily exactly. excludes negotiation and excludes cooperation if – the ownership of the property is private. Actually, you know, that's sort of his point, is that you can do whatever you like and, you know, live together and this, that, and the other, but ultimately, you, like, he works on the principle, at least he says so, and maybe he changed his mind about this when he got married as well, but he says, and in, in, he works on the principle, that ultimately, you know that everything has an owner, and that that's like, in a sense, a kind of you know the the least the cleanest arrangement i guess is the way is the way that he's sort of arguing it you can still both use the microwave but at the end of the day one of you owns the microwave and the other one owns the fridge well i guess well i guess what i was going to say was uh, if if the end result is the same you both get to use the microwave then why do you need the assignment well i think i think what it all comes down to in 
like the situation of like yeah i mean if you're going to if you if the marriage does ultimately stay a marriage for the rest of your life or what you would call a marriage then i mean the ownership is just kind of a semantic thing right because it's like yeah i own the refrigerator but i don't just keep he he doesn't just have to eat raw food all day or whatever or like not not keep anything cold um in that example but i think i think it's just more of an for him it was just an extension of his private property is a good thing so why why wouldn't we just get rid of the commons in that kind of problem with the commons thing well yeah and and again like like with the whole marriage thing um I think that he he goes a little bit too far with it, like in saying that this is the right way to go, and if you do it another way, it's going to be a problem. Like I don't, I don't have. I, I can see how a relationship where there is no marriage and where um, you know you lease out, you know, part of the the apartment or whatever, and there's ownership. I can see how that would work, and and there wouldn't be a problem. But I don't think that it's it's uh, logical to say that if you do it another way, it will lead to conflict. And I also, think it's a personal preference thing, right? Well, and even if it does lead to conflict, I don't understand why I have to assume that that's necessarily a bad thing. Right, yeah. And, and another thing is that, well, I, I think that he's even saying that the conflict will be unresolvable and that, like, it will end the relationship. But, but another thing that I wanted to add to this whole everybody owns something thing, which he even talks about in the, in the chapter is uh, children, which to me was just kind of like, <clears throat> it almost seems like cold to me to say like, well, when you agree to have kids, one person will like be the soul. Um, like it'll be agreed upon that the, that the kid is theirs. Like it'll be the, mo- the mother's kid. Well, I think that goes into what Murray Rothbard has talked about, about the ownership of children, like whether whether you can even own children. Like rather – like I don't think it's a matter of is it right that one person should own the children, but I think it's more of a question of should people own children at all, right? I, I, I'm not sure that Harry was that um, – I mean there is something – he talks about custodianship or something like that. There is certainly – you know, I don't think he was like literally saying, you know, one of you is going to own the children. The right. argument then – the argument was an extension of – it's the same argument about uh, – the, the same principle from the property, but he was basically saying like you should agree in advance that if you do split up, one of you is going to be – the custodian of the children, and that that should be something that is not going to be a, um, a dispute later on. That you know, you know where you're going and what the who's going to be the custodian. That just seems so like cold to me, though. Like I, I don't, I don't know if uh, if that's even something that can really possibly be decided upon before there's a relationship built with a child, like. Like say you know you're you're with your partner and 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 you say okay well if things don't work out then then the mother will get the child right like and then the father will is not responsible at all for the child but I don't know it just seems like really um, off to me like I couldn't I couldn't imagine making that kind of decision and also like if it's financial responsibility. And I'm not saying that anybody on this call would ever, would ever want anything like this. But if it's financial responsibility that, that they're concerned about, about like, well, if we have this kid and then we split up, I don't want to have to pay child support because that's something that he raised in the book. Then that person shouldn't be having this in the first place. Yeah, I understand. Absolutely. I understand exactly what you mean by it seems it seems cold to be talking about kids as though they're they're a piece of furniture. But is it the responsible thing to do, though, to, to be prudent, um, to think about these things ahead of time? I, I empathize with, with what you're saying, though, about it, it does seem cold. Um, but it, it's, it's hard to say, you know, where's the line between prudence and, and being cold? I think talking about 
you know, having an agreement about, you know, if you if you have responsibilities towards children, and you have a a relationship, and that child needs stable, good parenting and needs to have, um, you know, a, a a stable um, childhood, then in a sense, you know, one side of what Harry is saying in that book is don't get into a situation where if your relationship fails, you're arguing about who's going to be, um, who's, you know, who has what responsibilities over the child. And on one level, I, I, I can. I also think that um, you know, agreeing. Who knows? Things change, and you can. Uh, things can change in the in the future, and um, and you can certainly renegotiate things. But I think it is good to talk about what um, you know, what might happen, and how you might deal with it. It's just something really. I don't know. It just kind of brings up a lot of irritation for me to think about relationships uh, in the sense of like. Proceeding as if we were going to fail? No, I don't think that's what he's saying. Because proceeding as if we're going to fail is a very different thing from having sort of these explicit agreements like like Jake was just talking about. Like proceeding as if you're going to fail is going in that direction towards failure. And I think that's a very different thing from what this is. Yeah, I mean, I I, I totally agree that that it is uh, important to discuss, you know, just in case, like how things are going to have an agreement about it. And, um, and even with children, I, I can see how, how that makes sense to have, have a plan sort of thing. But I think that I, I, and I'm not sure exactly, maybe it, it was just something going on with me, but I did feel like a lot of irritation and, um, like annoyance with the way that it was kind of worded, I guess, in um, in the book about how to uh, kind of deal with with the children, and, and I think part of it has to do with because he kind of said like you don't want to be in a situation with somebody where you can't just go your separate ways, and this could very well have to do with the fact that I came from uh, divorced parents, and it was like not not a half, not an ideal situation at all. Uh, I don't know. Just something about that really bothers me. I, I also, Marissa, I, my parents um, actually never married and were definitely from the generation of, you know, he's also writing this in the early 70s, right? And in some senses, there was a general, like, uh, a whole strand of thought going around that generation, which was like, hey, you know, let's just hang out for as long as it feels good and see how it goes and who knows and so forth. And in many ways, you know, Harry Brown's kind of personal liberation ideas of those of the kind of hippies, he's sort of in, in some ways just codifying in this book. And I, I also have, like, given that I know the circumstances that I grew up in, I also have a deep suspicion of, of that. Um, just because I know how it worked out for me. But I do think it's very interesting to talk through without taking anything for granted, like to talk through the ideas and, and see, you know, on what basis would they have merit and, and what basis would they not, you know? I, I think there's also something to be said for the argument that making it explicitly or making the, the – making um, the fact that the relationship could end explicit, there could be the argument made that that would make the relationship better. Because if you kind of ignore the fact that the relationship could end, then it becomes almost like an implicit, yeah, this is going to just keep going forever. Whereas like Steph has talked about with, with his marriage with Christina, it's because of the very fact that they are very conscious of the fact that it's a voluntary relationship and that either of them could leave at any time. It's because, in part because of that fact that the relationship improves tremendously. So there could be, you could make that argument that setting those kind of prenuptial agreements at the beginning just sort of brings the element of choice back to the forefront. That's, that's a brilliant point, Greg. And indeed, like that point... I think as a universal point, he's quite consistent because he says 
in all business relationships, make sure that everyone can walk away tomorrow because you don't want to be forcing people in a business relationship to stick to the deal just because you've signed a contract. Make sure that everyone has their self-interest represented because then everyone's happy, everyone's a win-win situation. And he very much, he very clearly sort of applies that principle in his business dealings in saying, like, don't try and use contracts to push people to do things. And really what he's doing in this is just applying that to personal relationships and saying, okay, well, don't try and, you know, use contracts, i.e., in this case, marriage or, and so forth, to push people to do things. Make sure that everyone's there because they want to be and that as long as they, you know, that they can, can walk away any time and that it's not, you know, it's still going to remain at the foundations of the relationship is because people are happy and their self-interest is represented, not because they're in a contract. Right, right. That's, that's a brilliant point. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I completely agree with what, um, what you and Greg said. And, and knowing that, that relationships are voluntary definitely do make them better. Like Seth suggests the, um, you know, just checking in and making sure with the other partners if there's anything you can improve. And that's worked greatly in my marriage. But, um, yeah, something about the kids and like, and, and I, and I don't think that I'm being entirely logical on this point. Um, so I'll definitely have to think more about it, but, and, and, and I don't see any like flaw in, uh, in, uh, you know, trying to decide what would happen, uh, if you were to break up after you have kids, which is, you know, it's a possibility. But just something about it really bothers me, and I think it's probably because of my own personal history with my parents breaking up. Well, I think I think you can also, um, like with Marissa, I, I, I think I get what you're saying. In fact, I know I get to an extent what you're saying uh, about the kids, and I th- think what's missing is the kids' choice. So sort of when the breakup occurs, are we going to go by this explicit prenuptial agreement for where the kids go or do they get a say in the matter well to be fair on harry he does actually say when the kid's old enough to decide then it's their choice oh got it okay i missed that bit you know for me i I find this chapter this the this section like and a couple of other ones it's a bit like um some of the ideas that daniel mackler has you know i you know, I know there's something that I can't quite put my finger on that that I that is that gives me some resistance to agreeing with all of it. But it's really, I'm really glad that he wrote it because there's a lot of really valuable stuff to get you conscious about what it is that you do think in 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 a sense in debating with Harry in your own head. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. And you know what? You know what I think it is. I think that uh, Greg. I think. Uh, I think I just got it after what you said, because I think that the bottom line is, I mean, as far as my experience goes, and maybe this is just because of who, or probably definitely is just because of who my parents were, but um, I think that anytime the parents split up, it's going to be a shitty situation for the kid. Because when my parents first split up, Um, it was like partial custody of my dad where I would only get to see him every other weekend. I hated that. I mean, I hated it. I would cry like almost every night missing him. Um, so then my mom gave me more of a choice and asked what I would prefer. And, uh, I, they, or we all agreed upon, uh, doing every other week with each parent. But even that situation is just so like, dysfunctional because there's no like grounding there's no like sense of permanentness so i i guess and maybe maybe this isn't fair but uh because i'm basing uh the situation on on uh, my my history but i don't think that there can be like a positive situation for the children if the parents split up well no for sure i mean that's a it's a total disaster but um, I think I don't think that he was arguing that that was uh, a good turnout. I think he was just arguing that you need to uh, uh, minimize the damage. I guess. 
Sure, sure. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree with that. And I'm not trying to say that <clears throat> that's what he was trying to say, but, but I think that that's where my uh, problem with his uh, solution was, was just... You mean it just brings up, it brings up a lot of stuff for you because of the situation that you were in? Yeah, yeah, I think that that's... I, and I, I completely um, sympathise with that because, I mean, I was in the same situation too and joint custody totally blows. And, I mean, the, the, the whole situation is just a complete nightmare. Um, however it's resolved, if, if, the, if the parents don't provide a stable home and if they do break up it's just you know it's just a really really um i mean it's, it's not for no reason that it's one of the incidents on that childhood uh, trauma index you know right yeah absolutely and thank you for uh saying that yeah